Hey, welcome everyone to the Game Dev Discussion Podcast. As usual, I'm your host, Alex Benos, and this week I have my new art director, Eric Perselon. Dude, thank you so much for taking the time to come on. No worries. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> but, I mean, it's been really cool to sort of, I've been a fan of your work, like before joining Initiative, you know, I love the Silent Hill stuff, the, um, the Metal Gear Rex stuff I've seen on your art station. Uh, yeah, been a big fan of that style for a long time. So it's cool to talk to you. And like in extension, it's also, you know, being my art director, it's quite an interesting way this all came around. Um, now, I did a survey uh, with like people who listened to the podcast not long ago. Um, and one of the big things that came back was, I mean, I've had majority of my guests have been 3D environment art. I don't speak to many concept artists and that's where your career has been for the most part. Like recently you're um, an art director, but you built your career at DICE as a concept artist. So I think I want to start there. You've gone through like you're an intern, you're a junior, you're a mid, a senior, a lead. Um, you've gone through the whole ringer like of career progression. I want to start with, um, I guess, what does career progression look like for a concept artist and what i mean by that is as an environment artist the difference between like a mid to a senior is probably i just have more tools in my toolbox i know how to solve more problems which are really technical concept art and i don't mean if it sounds like this isn't derogatory but concept art doesn't feel as technical as say like something like environment art where there's all these like little things you want to get working this so what does progression look like? Is it raw ability? Is it a speed at which you produce your art? Like what, how do you go from an intern to a senior? What does that progression look like for a concept artist? There's uh, one way to answer that. I mean, I guess it's different depending on what company you're in and what your situation looks like. For me, it was starting as an intern. I was very green. Um, I kind of had this, you know, around... 2005 to 2008 there was this stigma in the concept art world about you know you should be painting everything you can't really use photos i kind of approached the entire concept art world that way i was trying to paint everything and as an intern i was painting and drawing most of my time um i think i picked like along the way i kind of picked up just like you use whatever techniques you need to to get the job done um i think in terms of career progression uh i would say it's uh it's probably like just how you present yourself to the team like it has a lot to do with soft skills um mm. actively solving problems um kind of you know communicating with with other disciplines and and showing how you're you're interested in the project as a whole and you're not only thinking about this painting you're thinking about how this painting is fitting into the bigger picture of the project um if someone is asking you to solve a problem you ask them questions like well uh, what is the world what does the world look like or like what is the motivation for these characters or um what is the motivation for the world why are we here why are the players there uh things like that uh you know just caring for what you do uh caring for your your craft um i think it's stuff like that that is you know um allowed me to step up and take more responsibility along the way because that's basically what happens um, as you take on higher positions you know um going from intern to uh mid level to senior like as a step between uh, mid level and senior for me was coaching new people on the team mm -hmm. kind of showing them how to do things or um just like how to approach the work things like that and then the biggest step was probably like from senior to lead that's when you need to run your 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 art team uh for me that was like i i kind of came out of the uh the team in stockholm and i, I moved into a team here in in la um, and our team here was very small, so it wasn't that huge step for me. Like I had two other artists uh, that I worked together with, um, but it did it did change a lot in terms of of mindset. You know, like yeah. I had a lead in Stockholm who could always help me out with everything, and like now I don't have him anymore. Uh, that was kind of the, you know, it was a bit like 
patting the umbilical cord or something. But, yeah, yeah, you kind of you're on your you got to sort of uh, you're thrown into the deep end. Now you've like you haven't got a life guard to, to keep an eye on you. Um, yeah. I want to go back to that that first point though. You said uh, you know when you first got in, you were an intern. There was a bit of a stigma mm-hmm. around, you know, everything has to be painted, not referencing all uh, photo bashing and stuff like that. Now, this is common in like 3D, and that's normally when a new software comes out. So we're seeing it right now with mega scans. You can't use mega scans; it's cheating, um, and we see that quite often. What sparked that in the in sort of the concept art world? Because it's not like photo photo bashing or like leveraging photos in a concept art is like. A software revolution. I mean, you've probably been able to do that since the existence of Photoshop. So why was this so prevalent or like a hot topic back when you were an intern? I mean, I don't know. I, I can't remember why it was like that. I guess it was just like full of purists back then. And as the, you know, as we've evolved, I guess uh, people have kind of taken on, you know, whatever means necessary to make the best result. Um, so and, and there's still that kind of there's different school of thoughts like there's still people who look at uh craig mullins one of the best concept artists ever and he still seems to be painting uh most of his work uh i i remember it like some things that he'd been saying about concepts like using 3d in concepts puts a bigger stamp on your work than he would prefer uh, so things like that that i was kind of listening to at the time um but um, I, I don't know, like, I can't speak to why it was like that. I just remember that, like, that was the work that I saw. Uh, mm-hmm. That was the work, you know, I was, work, I was looking at artists, uh, you know, working on Mass Effect. They're like the early Mass Effect, God of War 3, like back in, in those days. Um, that was kind of the inspiration for me. And uh, I think that the change just hit me hard when I, when I got into DICE because... Uh, the first project that I was on as an intern was Battlefield 3. And uh, I remember that the the point in time was uh, the concept artist who was on that project, he was basically, he was illustrating single player levels. Mm-hmm. And the process for doing that was like, if you're only one guy, because there was only one concept artist on Battlefield 3, and he couldn't be painting everything, yeah. uh, you know, to illustrate an entire single player campaign. So the direction that he got from the art director was basically like, just take a photo that is as close as possible to the experience that we want to do, you know, do whatever you need to on the photo to like get it into the range of like speaking to this is what it should look like. And like, don't spend more than an hour per, <laughs> per concept. Um, and that was kind of a hard way of, of uh, getting started because like being purist and painting everything, like now I'm being told to like, just, just use a photo and get it into uh, get it into the zone and that will be uh, good enough so there's a bit, so on that with concept art and i say concept art it's like i've seen concept artists tweet before like it's not concept art it's content design and i've struggled this at times like you know working in game dev you are always under a certain amount of restrictions whether that's time um resources whatever it is and it's like at one point or another, your art stops becoming art. Like, you're not making a piece of art, you're making a thing. Like, you know, games get optimized. Like, you can make this amazing sculpt of a, a character or an environment that has to get optimized down, and you lose quality through that process. So you kind of, you have to become, like, dis- uh, not attached to your art. Do you... I'm guessing that's kind of the same with what you what was happening there at the time then. Like, if you're having to photo bash... And like you said, like a, like a a day or an hour to like each shot. It's like you're not really producing art at that point because your art you'd probably spend a whole like week, two weeks, months, whatever on. You're just yeah. purely. It's a really functional thing, right? Like you don't really want to call it art. It's just a a functional right. piece of content. Yeah, I mean you're solving problems, right? And, yeah. Uh, I get like I've seen this in a couple of the like you've seen it in other disciplines as well. It's kind of similar to like animation you know to be, to become an animator you need to learn how to uh keyframe animate and like some of the the some of my friends that i went to school with uh they got into animation by doing that and they really wanted to like hand animate you know pixar movies or something like that um and once they got into something like uh uh got into dice um it would <laughs> like that is very different right like you don't 
key animate soldiers. You work with mocap data. Um, so it's a change in mind shift, uh, or a mindset shift uh, rather, uh, to kind of evaluate what tools do you need to use to solve the problem that is ahead of you. Um, and so that's kind of where I've kind of progressed over time to just like see the benefits of using photos. Mm -hmm. uh, like right now, I'm, I mean, I push my concept artists to just use photos. Like there's a lot of 3D um, trending right now in the concept world. And I see the benefits of it. Um, but at some, at, at a certain point, as you probably know, like, 3D can just look really stiff and stale, and you you you're missing that um, the grounding elements. And if you're working on a keyframe shot or whatever, like at some point you just have to kill the 3D ness of a of a painting mm -hmm. and bring it into Photoshop, uh, Photoshop, and and add like a layer of photo bashing or painting over it to kind of just make everything kind of come together. Mm -hmm. Is when you say come together, and I thought about this before, like when I look at. Um... And like I'm, the, the name's escaping me now, but there's a, a concept artist where he's focusing purely on like blocking out composition shapes, and then he's loosely painting over. And at one point when he calls it done, I look at it, and I'm like, that's a beautiful piece of art, but it's so loose. And it's because, and I think the reason I found it to be a really interesting piece of art was there was a lot of room for interpretation. Like everything wasn't spelled out to me. Like you, a tree wasn't just a tree. It was like I looked at a shape and I kind of inferred that it was a tree. There was mossy, um, the flow of the level. I guess that's kind of what uh, I, I think that's what you're talking about, where like you kind of take out this because, like I said, 3D can be very sterile when you add that sort of painterly layer on top of it. It's like it allows it to be interpreted again rather than being very objective, I guess. Um, it's, it's from looking at um, what's oh god, I'm really pissed me off. I can't remember the name, but we were talking about it in, a, in another Discord and like he was they were showing his painting process. And he, he had 3D in there, and eventually he took the 3D out and just, like, uh, lasso tooled around elements and moved it all around. Because he's like, I don't like how... Uh, he kept using the word sterile. So I don't know why that, that, that word's in my head. But it's like, it allowed the work to be inferred. You had to look at it, and you had to kind of, like, look at the image and really look at it for a couple of minutes to, like, really understand what's happening in it. Is that kind of what's happening when you're breaking... When you say breaking the 3D, you're kind of loosening everything up a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I I usually talk about energy in a painting, and mm -hmm. I think that's what you're tapping into there. Like, just look at someone like, I mean, the best painters do this really, really well. Like, look at someone like Richard Schmid, for instance. Like, he's probably one of the most known. I mean, he's not a concept painter, but he's a fine artist. Um, but he his style of painting is is has so much energy to it and such a clear focus like there's always like a really clear focal point where he puts most of the detail and then there's like a big part of the canvas is really suggestive with just like simple brush strokes um there's definitely a school of thought uh, in concept where like a lot of people kind of approach it from that from that end. and then that's kind of where i started was to do stuff like that like that's what i wanted to do um as a 3d artist you know you work on individual elements right mm -hmm. like you sculpt this rock and you make this wood and you you kind of make all of the individual elements and then you put them together in a scene and the worst part of it is when it just becomes like well here's a rock here's a tree here's a ground here are all of the like separate elements um and they're not put together in a good way right like they uh, that i think that's why it's super important to you know work with pbr that you get things to kind of live in the same family, like in the mm -hmm. same value range. And then you work with like your scene, you work with fog, uh, you work with uh, visual elements that kind of glue the scene together. So I think that's why, you know, so much of the, the Last of Us artwork is working so well because they have this foliage to just mm -hmm. like tie everything together. Like that is the visual glue that kind of makes everything uh, sing and is not just like a, a bunch of separated assets. Yeah, and it also when you have all them three D elements, like you could spend a long time making every little three D element really, really nice. Like, um, you know, you make it a, be a beautiful rock, and like on its own in isolation, it's just amazing rock. When you do that mm -hmm. for every single thing, suddenly it's like okay, everything's super detailed. And uh, speaking to uh, Marcel Shaika from um, Crytek when they're working on Hunt Showdown, he's like just being able to like 
inferred like add enough detail to something to like for it to look right at like with everything else because like if everyone made a barrel and the fishing nets and the buildings all hero assets like you don't really like it's just a lot of noise and there's a lot of stuff to process where and i think that's last of us is a great example um the one i always look at is like um sony santa monica with god of war like they had the visual balance between all their 3d assets so down it was kind of like nothing stood out if that made sense like and i mean they were also super hard on textual density so like it was nothing stood out nothing broke by like immersion you just sort of you looked at a space and you just sort of nothing caught your eye but everything looked really cool at the same time it's like this really weird thing that happened when you played them games um and also speaking to you know that style we had a very interesting conversation and it's actually what really uh sort of spurred me on to like okay we need to talk about this more on the podcast i said to you when well, you because you, if anyone who's watching this on youtube you can see eric has a really uh, big bookshelf behind him and there's some comic uh stuff you have on there like um big a3 comic books with the original illustrations and you said at dice you did a lot of these and i said that's really odd like i think of dice and i think of hyper realism really odd to hear you say um you did a lot of like quite uh, illustrative type con concepts out there so let's just retread that conversation a little bit because that was super interesting to me because i never heard it said before so at dice you did a lot of con uh, comic -y type art why uh, how were you able to do that at a studio which is renowned for hyper realism photo scans all the stuff like that well so i think it's a big part of it is the, the people around you right like i had two there was two other concept artists when i started uh one or one concept artist and one storyboard artist and both of them were super into comic books and really really talented comic book artists and maybe that's why i got in as well because I'm, i was not a great painter but i had like a bunch of uh, comic book stuff in my portfolio. I wanted to be a comic book artist for the longest time, uh, and I was trying to do that. And I, I only did like black and white drawings for, I don't know, five, five, ten years almost um, before shifting into like, okay, I need to learn how to paint, and um, you know, uh, started looking at concept art. Um, so that definitely influenced me. You know, we would go to uh, comic book stores at lunchtime and just like. Uh, dig through the the shelves of all of the 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 comic book artists that we look up to, um, but I think also like the style of of dice games, um, they they know what they're doing, right? Like we know they kind of set the the look for Battlefield. Everyone knows that it's realistic, um, and that kind of gives the concept artist the freedom to have a bit more of like their own style uh, in how they illustrate things. So uh, I didn't do much comic book style artworks. Uh, what I did was uh, when we did character art, for instance, we didn't have to illustrate like these photo reel characters, photo bashing and uh, kind of use that whole approach to illustrate what the characters should look like in Battlefield. We could make them as uh, comic book characters. Like, I think there's even a strength in that because you're simplifying the elements to just like, if you're uh, doing a comic book character, you're focusing on silhouette, you're focusing on exaggerating features, you're focusing on, you know, putting accent colors where they matter and things like that. Um, so you're simplifying, like you're not getting into the details of like finding the right photos to make it look photo real, but you're focusing on like the big picture read or like the squintable read of a character from a distance. Um, and everyone could look at those drawings and they could, you know, they could see it in their mind of what this is going to look like, you know, when it goes to, to character art. Um, so everyone kind of, everyone knows this, the look of, of, uh, of Battlefield. And, uh, once we give those to the character art team, like they would just take it and run with it. Like we wouldn't really be connected from that point. Like they would just, um, they would look at our designs, they would look at gear online, so like they would purchase equipment and uniforms and all of this, they would dress it up on a mannequin, photo scan it, um, and uh, it would, you know, it, it was pretty cool to see that process, you know, you did a doodle at some point and um, then it turns into like the photorealist, uh, photorealistic characters that you see in the game. I think one great example of this is um, in the Battlefield 1 art book. There are some really early 
exploratory sketches uh, that we did on the concept team, which was just you know exploring shapes, like what is interesting about this time period, what does the mask look like, how do we you know use capes and things like that for interesting silhouettes. Um, those were really really rough and really like comic book uh, type illustrations um, that the character art team did a really good job of like translating into real characters. You know, I can imagine being a 3D artist, both character and environment on that team would have been a lot of fun because I guess, you, you know, you're constantly seeing just really cool, like, it, it gets it gets a little bit a step closer to being just art. Like, it's not it's not getting too sterile, it's not getting too realistic, there's a lot of room for interpretation. And I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm assuming between the different concept artists, you had wildly different styles. It weren't like you were all copy and paste of each other and if, like, you were showed a concept, you'd probably be able to know who did that because of the style of it, I'm guessing. Yeah, there was definitely more of that uh, when I was at DICE. Uh, you could see from each of the separate concepts, like, who did did which one. Um, and I think, I, I don't know, like, I have a, I'm a bit torn on this because I think there's a value in that. Like, there's definitely a value in, you know, allowing an artist to have their own expression and kind of uh, do what they feel right and, you know, have them go in their own, um, uh, you know, explore their own path. Um, I do think it's, or it has been proven to be tricky on other projects that I've been on when you're early on a project and you have XX that needs to see what the project is going to look like. So you have like, you need to present something to higher ups or you, you know, there's always people um, proving the the steps to continue the project, right? Um, so for on uh, for on uh, for new IPs or like being early on a completely new project when you don't know what that look is, um, I think it is very important to uh, be consistent that like all of the the art pieces that you put together feels like it belongs in the same world that you don't have like some concepts that are cartoony looking that you have other concepts that are photo real like then uh, depending on who you present it to they won't be able to make out what, what you're actually trying to do which is a problem that i've seen on on some previous projects where uh we did have like a range of styles and it just caused confusion yeah um, and that's that's where i look uh look for inspiration uh with studios like um and naughty dog is definitely really good at like unifying their style mm -hmm. you can kind of pick out still like with some of those guys like who did what but um in general like it's super consistent all of the work that came out for last of us 2 um and uh there are other studios like that you know quantic dream did a really good job with like the consistency of their concept art for um detroit become human i think mm. they had like five or six different concept artists but like i can't tell who did which uh art piece um and that that it has its own strength, right? Like then then it becomes really clear. Like the vision for this is extremely sharp. Um, yeah. And once you you know if they were to make a sequel to Detroit, then maybe you could explore more uh, a wider range of styles and and kind of let people do uh, what they like. Well, I guess it, it, you basically want to leave on a something earlier or a new eye, You want something that leaves very little room for interpretation because. Like I said, you probably yeah. still think like you don't want someone to interpret something wrong, run with it, and you're like, oh no, 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 that you not that that was what we we're going for. And I think we, it's very, I all I got really shown this when at my um couple of studios ago when I was working more like as a as meeting clients, I was speaking to investors. It's a much smaller studio, and we get. I think it's quite easy for us to get to echo chambers when you're around creatives, and I don't mean like um. You know, just artists. I mean, I think producers they spend so much time around artists, they pick up a lot of lingo and terminology and the ideas. Producers, artists, designers, we're very used to people who are creative. So when we're like you show like a illustrative type character, like in any of them people see it, they're like, No, no, I can imagine what that is because of it's battlefield. I can connect the dots and I get it. Whereas you show like someone who's you know, a board member or executives, they're like they don't on the day to day have to think that way. So you show them something, they're like, I, I thought we we're making a realistic game. This is a comic book. No, no, no. Just imagine that realistic. 
What do you mean? Imagine, look, that's a comic character. You just show me a comic character. It's like, oh, God, no, no, you lost. Almost, yeah, almost exactly that thing happened on a project that I was on. Yeah, it's so frustrating. And then it's like, it's hard because you, we also speak, like I've said this many a times, like every discipline speaks its own language. Art itself speaks its own language. So it's very hard to have a conversation with somebody where it's like, if I was speaking to a producer, I, this actually happened to me when I was like, oh no, you're missing a point. We're just worrying about the macro forms and we'll worry about the micro detail later. And he was like, what the fuck do you mean? That, uh, what do you mean macro? Like, look, it looks wrong to me. And I'm like, oh, you know, he, no, he said it looks like a low, it looked like a PS1 game. And it's like, yeah, because we're only worrying about the macro forms. And that's the conversation. And we made no head. It, it, yeah, we had to like go back to drawing board and like develop it more. And it was like, he just spoke a different language to me. And we just could not like move forward on something. And it was a big reminder. Like, yeah, we end up in a little bit like an echo chamber, I guess. Like it is a, you're around people every day, speaking to people every day who all speak your language. And then you go step out of that, like into normal life, you know, with my family or anyone else. And I have to relearn how to speak like a normal human being again. Um, but you see, yeah. when you, with, with this though, there's one thing you also mentioned and I, I you know, off air, and I want to really explore this. You mentioned you explored like different ways to produce concept art. One of them being, say, like three sixty art. Mm-hmm. Um, let I just want to talk about what that process looked like, the idea of it, the like process, and what the outcome was. Because my media thought when you mentioned that was, is that just a cool novelty, or is that actually beneficial to us in terms of you know understanding a project better? So the three sixty stuff. How did that come about? What was it like? Yeah, I mean, that's exactly the question that we were asking ourselves as well. Um, I would say, so this was back when I was working at uh, Dice LA and I had a team of two other uh, guys that I was working with. Um, So as a lead, I wanted to um, kind of spark the conversation of like, how do we take this to the next level? Like, how do we kind of explore new ways of doing things you know it was around the time when i was starting to pick up blender so i learned maya back in school so i was using maya now and then but i haven't been using maya a lot for concept art because i don't like maya <laughs> like it's just a beast of a program it takes like five minutes yeah. to just open the damn thing um <laughs> it's so, so true so- it is like it's awful. Why is it so slow compared um, to Blender, which is a much bigger piece of software? Exactly, it has more yep. stuff, and it's like instant. It just opens in two seconds. So that's the first selling point for Blender. Anyway, uh, we were exploring a lot of different techniques and kind of processes for, you know, what can we do to kind of take concept art to the next level, or like how can we? Uh, it, it was just like exploratory. Like we weren't thinking that we would, you know break any new grounds or anything but like uh and i honestly like there was nothing that we really came up with it was more like uh, i think jama's tutorials came out at the time with uh, the 360 painting and we were like well this looks cool but like what can we use it for i know there was a, a bunch of uh, so uh, there was a bunch of tutorials that was kind of showing like drawing in 360 so 360 uh, maybe i should just talk about what what i mean uh, it's basically when you in Photoshop, you can uh, you can create like a 3D layer that is basically putting yourself at the center of a big dome. Um, so you can rotate the camera around, and you can basically draw the from the inside. You kind of draw the the space around you, and then you can, can kind of turn around in there, and you can get like it. It's uh, it can be very immersive um, when you do that. So like you can see what you know what you, your project is going to look like if you're painting from the inside of that that sphere or whatever one thing we noticed early on from just like drawing is like it takes forever to draw like an entire sphere and draw everything around like uh, everything around you like you will start in a corner like this but then like oh there's so much (laughs) the visual space around you like that takes forever so that was like something we hit early on that like this is never going to work uh for production or anything else um so what we started doing was building things in 3d putting a camera and rendering out an equi rectangular uh image that we then would open up in photoshop um and which would basically allow you to like you know if you do your concept from 
you you're blocking things out in 3D early, um, and you you're getting that you get it projected onto that sphere. Then you can uh, like photo bash or paint on top of that. That was a much better uh, starting point because like you have perspective, you have lights, so, like all of that is just like it works in the mm -hmm. 3D space. You have scale references and all that. Um, so that was getting us a little bit closer, and we were like, okay, we could maybe use something for this. Um, I, I still haven't been on a project where we ended up using it early on. I, I guess like that that could be one way that it could be used, you know, uh, or on a project early on, um, you could render out these spheres, uh, these spheres as like imagine the game looking like this and you can show it to someone you can even like uh, export it to vr maybe and like give someone a headset and like they mm -hmm. can look around and like oh yeah they will, this would will be a cool game uh, so you yeah. can kind of show that experience early but what, what the only use case that i had um was uh pretty late on in production on on one of the battlefield one expansion packs um i rendered out uh, we got one of the engineers to implement uh, implement the, the functionality in Frostbite. So basically, from any point in the world, he would render a cube map, like a six-based right. uh, cube map, that you could export and you can convert it to equ equi-rectangular format. Um, and that was useful because then I could do paintovers of our game in 360. Yeah. But even with that, it's like when normally when you do uh, paintovers of the game you, you're looking at something very specific right like you do a, con a, a screenshot of this area we're like we need to solve this area this looks terrible like can you work on the composition or the materials or the lighting or whatever it may be um, when you're l uh, rendering out a 360 view you're not looking at anything you're taking in the scene basically yeah um, like it would be very hard for me to say that like look at the detail right here like that's what I here's where I did like my paint over so what I found it, the only thing I found it being useful for was to render out um, a point in the world and do a, a broad strokes paint over of like atmospherics lighting and what like the, the mood should be in that shot so like color grading um, and that kind of stuff, and like painting in clouds and wispy uh, uh, fog layers and things like yeah. that. Like that, it really helped for that to kind of then send that off to someone, have them open it, and kind of look around and see, like, okay, this is what we're aiming for. Um, other than that, I don't think that we found any good use for it, and it's not something I use today. So you said um, that is kind of like you you're seeing different ways to produce concept art. That's the original, like, kind of um, a driver for it. Mm -hmm. Was there a reason you, that you were looking for other ways or, like, your team was looking for other ways to produce concept art? Like, were you trying to solve a particular problem or was it more just curiosity or, like, hey, this is another way, another type of art we could produce, let's investigate it? Or was there an actionable thing, like, oh, let's, we need to look at different ways to make concept art for... X, Y reasons. Was it curiosity or was there like an objective reason behind it? There was no reason behind it. It was more curiosity, like keeping people engaged. I mm -hmm. guess that's a big benefit, like just keeping the team excited and uh, forward looking. And uh, it kind of helps. It, 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 for me, it kind of goes back a little bit to the, uh, the mindset uh, from school where we were... Um, learning a lot of new software and we were kind of looking into all of the new technology that was coming along um and so for me it was just like that it was just curiosity it was just like hey can we be more efficient you know yeah. by using this um is is there something we can do here uh you know we've been uh exploring sculpting in vr for instance and drawing in vr um is there a use for that you know and um uh, some of the artists that I work with still use that for 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 concept. I would say it's like it's a great way to block out big shapes. Yeah. Um, if you compare it to ZBrush or 3D Coat, like uh, I guess 3D Coat is kind of the closest thing. I've used 3D Coat a little bit, but I never really got into the mojo of that software. Mm -hmm. Like I never, it never really stuck with me. But um, VR is much more intuitive. It's kind of doing the same thing, but more intuitive. It's easier to just like draw things out and kind of like um, 
quickly rotate, like the, especially the Boolean operations, you know, in, yeah. in um, uh, medium, uh, mm -hmm. the VR sculpting software. Uh, I just pick a mesh from my brush and I just like, I, I scrape things out of, uh, out of my mesh, which is much more, it's much easier than it was in, in 3D code, kind of like rotating and then placing an object right here and then mm -hmm. applying. And then, you know, it was just the way too slow. Um, VR is quite yeah. interesting because we, uh, I, I went to a Vertex conference talk and Dylan Sison, a Pixar uh, tech director, like was talking about, he's a big fan of VR, like in medium. And it, Photoshop did for a bit like these uh, medium battles where like uh, they'd have two artists, like you have five minutes, scoop something. Um, they were given it like a cue and he was part of that. But it, we were talking about like concept arcs. He showed me a couple of videos and it was like, he said it was very, he found the VR painting to be very beneficial to the artist, not so mm -hmm. much to the viewer. Like to the artist, they're very because you can't really get bogged down in details. He said he was like, yeah. it's very hard to get micro. You have to be very broad, and that kind yeah. of forces your hand into being very deliberate. Your shapes, all these big, you, you know, big forms, and it allowed them to cover a lot of ground very quickly and stay out of the detail and allow them to like, you know, really figure out them big shapes quickly. And then he said it was quite nice to export that out and then go into Photoshop and work into it a little mm -hmm. bit more. Um, once he solved them big problems. And I was like, okay, that, that I could see, like, and you watch the video of them working, you can see them looking around and going, yeah, this isn't really flowing. He just sort of starts spraying is, and that's the way I could describe it. It's like a spray paint. It looked like when he was working. And I'm like, that's, I could see the use case for that. Like I said, it's not great for the viewer of the art. Like, it's probably a bit of a mess. But for the artists themselves, it looked very beneficial for them to figure out stuff without being kind of hamstrung or going down. Like, you know, they find one bit they like, and then suddenly they're, like, painting little grass blades and shit like that. And it's like, okay, you've probably gone too far with that little section. That's, yeah. That seemed beneficial. I found like two really great uses of it. Um, so for mesh creation, I would say like or organic stuff, um, it works better for me to like draw something out in in medium compared to like uh, I guess like in ZBrush, the equivalent would be to like put these spheres and kind of pose those and drag those around and create a mesh from that. Mm -hmm. um, in medium, I would like to just like be able to draw things out. So like actually like creating the starting point is really easy to do in VR. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is uh, for something more structural, like architecture or something, um, it's not the greatest for doing stuff like that, it's, it, at, at least not medium. Maybe there's other uh, software that I haven't tried yet. But what I found was really cool was I did some architectural pieces in Blender. So I did them, you know, traditional modeling, low poly, um, exported them to Medium and imported them so that like all of the separate objects would be separate, separated inside of Medium as well. And so I could kind of like pick them individually and work on them uh, individually. And what I really found useful there was uh, taking like a rock brush or something on my uh, sculpting tool and kind of dig out of architectural pieces. So like imagine, I think I was doing like a pillar at the time and I was kind of imported it from Blender, super high resolution, but then I was kind of like digging out of the mesh mm -hmm. um, in, in Medium. And it was really, really fast and intuitive to do that. Um, and I, because I pick a 3D brush, like it, it, it grabs that entire thing, like mm -hmm. that chunk out of the, out of the mesh. Um, you could do something similar in, in ZBrush, but like you in ZBrush, ZBrush, you're more manipulating the surface rather than like digging yeah. out the voxels. Um, so I, I found it useful for that. I haven't done too much of that since, but I'm, it's one. Of, it's a workflow that I find really like just as an artist, it's super fun to yes to change up your workspace. You know, go into VR for five ten minutes. I can't really stomach being in there more than that. But oh really? Uh, doing some really quick uh, Boolean operations in there, and then you kind of export the result and uh, mm -hmm. take it into ZBrush for, you know, more detailing. It's pretty cool. So uh, just speaking of software, it's been quite interesting about your portfolio that I noticed. Uh, you know, when we mentioned previously, you know, concept art, you're designing, you're, de you're, you're problem solving. Um, there's like a different type of designer, which I've seen, which are these hard surface gods who like, um, everything's, you know, the perfect topology, booleans, 
And they're kind of like, it's far more precise design, like they're designing the form and function of a vehicle or a gadget or a weapon. You've done a lot, quite a bit of in, uh, I think it was Blender you used, but like say, for example, the Samus suit you did with the MGS style aesthetic. That's just raw design going on. Like that's the 3D design work going on. And it's not like you, you've just dipped your toe. You're like, you're pretty competent at it. What led you down? Like, is that always been something you're interested in in the sort of the more modeling type of design? Or is that something as you've sort of got more senior and like, now being an art director, you need, you know, both kind of hands because it feels like the concept art is like them like the a lot of stuff needs to be informed like oh how does this shape come together what does this space look like when you're doing the modeling side of it it's like it's far more precise and deliberate this is how this thing works functionally it fits into here then here and then a bolt goes there it, where did that come from like with that curiosity is it just a, a problem solver in you just led you down that rabbit hole um where, where did all um, that come from i i, I can't i don't know where it comes from but i i would say about the samus suit so that's all zbrush um mm -hmm. and uh, i actually find it pretty difficult to work in 3d and design at the same time uh zbrush and vr is probably like the only exception for that mm -hmm. but to me like i can i don't feel like the tools are in the way of me designing quite as much but still i'm trying to even with the uh, even with the the samus suit um i would sculpt something in zbrush and whenever i felt like i don't know where to take this i would take a screenshot and i would open it in photoshop and i would draw over it and kind of figure things out and kind of like okay this would work like just because uh with drawing there's nothing between me and designing like it, yeah. that's how i design um, so that makes it easier to like problem solve, and then you put that on your pure F board, and then you go back into ZBrush, and then you continue sculpting. Um, working in Blender, like designing in Blender, uh, while you're building things out, like low poly stuff, just doesn't work for me. Um, I, I I think that's uh, unless you are as comfortable working in 3D um, as you are drawing. Mm -hmm. um, I don't. I think that's a bad idea. Uh, I've, I've seen very few people can do that efficiently. I think most people would agree that they would start with like photo bashing or a quick drawing or putting together a few different references. Like you could do that. You can mm -hmm. take like, okay, here's here's the base of a rifle, but I'm gonna change this this part to this reference and kind of like hit bash something together. But you still have reference that you're building from. Like I think that's what that's an efficient way of like starting in 3D. Um, or, you know, you can do a, a block mesh, um, like keeping things really simple. As long as you have that process down, I just, yeah. if I work in blend, Blender, I kind of easily lose picture of the bigger picture and I, I yeah. kind of like go into the details right away. Um, that's right. So I, I guess I guess that well, that's why, you know, I, I prefer to kind of solve the problems beforehand in Photoshop or anything so else. You mentioned earlier that you were a Maya guy first. Now, aside, aside from the what we've already mentioned, that is a heavy ass piece of software. All the Autodesk software is heavy as shit and takes an hour to load. Um, what other like, things like moved you you like into Blender? Like, because um, I mean, it's been nice for. I only got into it like a couple of years ago when two point eight came out, and like you know, uh, the industry suddenly started noticing Blender a little bit. I took it less, yeah, more seriously because for the longest time, if you'd have mentioned to a AAA artist, "Hey, we should use Blender," they'd probably laugh at you. Whereas like now it's like, hey, we should use Blender. Yeah, I probably should. Uh, like, where, where, what made you go from Maya to Blender? Like, was it just the fact that it was free, or was there some tools in there that you like, you quite liked? The time. So, uh, let's see here. So I was using Maya, and I was mainly using Maya for modeling. I think the biggest, the biggest, uh, the first point that got me sold on blender was probably the rendering um, yes. cy cycles was so much more straightforward than mental ray <laughs> i yes. learned mental ray which is just a headache in itself uh, this was before maya transitioned into arnold um, so i saw some of the cycles renders uh, ren uh, renders and I, I just felt like that looks really good it seems uh, simple enough to you know try it out um oh it was also like 
so I was working, I was using Maya and uh, another artist was using uh, Blender. When we were doing this, um, uh, the 360 painting that I was talking about, when we were rendering these equirectangular uh, images, so I was like, oh, it's super easy in Maya. You just have to download this plugin, and then you have to install it, and then you have to do this and that. Uh, and then in Blender, it was just like, well, you just select equirectangular from the render camera, and yeah. and that was it. I was like, oh, OK, that is easier. Uh, so I started trying it out. I, I was still, so for a long time, I was modeling in Maya. Then I exported everything to Blender, and I rendered in cycles. There was a lot of things that were just made more sense for me in in, uh, in Blender. In Maya, Maya had a bunch of weird shit going on. Like you select an object, and like to do this thing, you need to select the shape node. Well, how do I select the shape node? Oh, you hit down on the keyboard. <laughs> it's just like yeah. what? And then like it changes the I can't remember the attribute panel or something changes to be something completely different. I'm like this. I have no idea. Like I didn't understand what was happening under the hood. Yeah, if that makes sense. Um, and the UI was just like, well, this is the UI. You take it or leave it in Maya. In Psych, yes. in Blender, you can you can customize the like uh, you can customize the UI to be whatever you want because yes. all of the windows are exactly the same. You just change it to be whatever you want it to be like do you want it to be the outliner do you want it to be 3d view like it's all modular like that made so much sense to me um so there was a uh yeah so like i was saying i was modeling in maya i was exporting it i was surrendering it in blender at some point in time it just like why don't i just learn how to model in blender so i spent a week i think um with um von Ling's tutorials heavy poly um so i bought into his ecosystem with uh, the uh, hot keys and everything that he set up um but that was really good because like he his background was in modo i've been trying modo a little bit yes. in terms of modeling um and he kind of like took all of the functionality from modo and all of the modeling tools and kind of implemented it in blender or like made it more accessible through his custom uh, hot keys and and pie, uh, pie charts and, and stuff like that. Um, so it really that, needs that, it as well, by the way. Like you, you, I, Blender is like ZBrush in my eyes. Like both of them have awful UI and awful layouts. Like, and but that's fine because it's meant to be that way because you make it what you want it to be. I want pie map yeah. menus. I want a custom menu here. Like it's like it's that bad that you kind of go. Well, I can make it my own and. I feel almost like that's intentional. Like it's going to be that bad. We're going to force you to make it what you need it to be. And I think that's great. Cause like, I can't use default blender, like default blender for me. Sure. Could speed on the right hand side of the keyboard and shit like that. I'm like, I had to use machine tools, like with the pie menus and the custom keys. I'm like, Oh yeah, this is like, makes more sense to me. This feels nice to use versus the blend blenders default. I'm like, there's some stuff which just doesn't, just doesn't work. Like, but I think it's, I feel like it's intentional. I feel like they're like, we'll make it that bad or that that cumbersome that you're gonna make it what you want it to be, and you're gonna be more efficient for it. Because that's what yeah. feels like with ZBrush. Yeah, I mean, ZBrush is a hot topic. <laughs> that UI is very unique. That UI is horrible. The it's it's honestly awful. But is things with ZBrush, I feel like the I have a lot of custom menus, so like I press one and a custom menu pops up where my cursor is. Mm -hmm. The the UI is that bad. I've made it such a way where, like, I never have to leave my little canvas space. Like, I never have to move my eyes off my piece of work to, like, dig through a menu. And that's something I didn't like about um, Max and Maya. Both of them, you spend so much time in menus trying to find your tool. Whereas a Blender, like, if I want to move something, I'm like, GX2. It'll move two meters to yes. the, on the X-axis. I'm like, I don't leave my viewport to go into menus. Yeah. I'm always in my viewport, which is why it reminds me of ZBrush. But Yeah, that's... That's a really good point. Like the efficiency of 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 uh, Blender. So yeah. one thing that is really uh, like a, a huge problem, I think, with three D software is when precision is an important aspect of how you interact with the software. Like in Maya, I have to click this tiny mm -hmm. little line to be able to move along that axis. Like you should never have to. You know, if you miss it. You ac accidentally select something that is behind it, and yeah. you you have to like reselect your thing, and then you have to go back into edit mode or whatever. 
like uh, the how easy it is to just rearrange things in Blender. Mm -hmm. Like you said, the the hotkeys for moving and like quickly uh, either like moving along an axis or along yeah. a plane. Like yeah. it's so fast to lay out a scene in Blender because you're just like you have the hotkeys. You just like you don't have ever have to like click an axis arrow and like move things around and like it. It's honestly like even uh, working in on Unreal. You know, I I started picking up a little bit of that and like it's just mind-boggling to me that I have to click these arrows to move things around like. It at least it has like surface snapping, so you know objects. Could, you know that uh, functionality is in projected. there, by the way. The you know what we have in Blender, the GX, and it'll move on the X axis. Yeah, yeah. That's in Unreal. It's just hidden. I've forgotten the short. I've already forgotten. It. It's a really arbitrary function. But you're right. It's, I, I've never heard it articulated like that. But you're right. It's the precision side of it because the thing that made Blender help with me when I was coming from vanilla to machine tools is machine tools pie menus are pie menus themselves. I never have mm -hmm. to. Click, I flick. It's like if I want, um, yeah, like I want to go in object mode, I'll just tap and flick up anywhere in the screen, but that's got to flick up and I'll get that menu or vertex or edge or whatever. I never have to click on a pixel on the screen, I just gesture where I want to go and it does yes. it. And I'm like, it's so fast. And I mean, it's terrifying to watch people in that software who are actually really good at it. Like, um, who's a good example? Like, I mean, if you watch any of Tor Frick's streams when he's in in Modo and you're like, this dude's moving so fast, I don't get how it's happening. And there's a, a couple of weapon artists, a war dog, who are like, are like, Ola, he's fantastic in Blender. And I remember watching him just like noodle on something. And I'm like, dude, well, I, well hold on. Well, what did you do there? How did you do that? And he's like, oh, that's just this three, three buttons, which I'm like, that's a crazy foot. He's when he, actually, that's how I learned about moving on an edge, like conform to an edge. He had like a diagonal edge with some verts on it. And he pressed G twice. And it moves only on them on that edge. And I'm like, dude, that's four clicks in a side menu in 3ds Max to get it to do that. Like, yeah. that's so cool. Yeah. And it's crazy. I used uh, that's so useful. Eh? Do you know that if you hit G twice, you start sliding along the edge. You can also hit if you hold C, you will continue to move along that same axis. So you can actually like move outside of that. Um, oh, off the object. Yeah. Oh shit, that's pretty. See. It's so useful. Like there's just tools like that that is super useful in Blender. Uh, also, like another big selling point is the modifiers. Like I wasn't even aware of modifiers that so that was a thing. Um, yeah. I heard Max has the same thing, but like just being able to work non-destructive um, is uh, yeah, that's a huge selling point for sure. It, all I need to do is get the edit poly modifier and then I'll be, it'll, it'll max be dead in my eyes. <laughs> it's um, the only thing, and this is really frustrating for me. There's a lot of really good quirky little features that, that Blender has where, like you said, the, the cube map stuff, it's quite a, <laughs> it's quite a niche specific thing that it's like, okay, that's pretty cool that has it. All the cycles or the uh, real time render engine which is really useful for anyone like myself who does a lot of material work. I can prove out a shader in Blender and it's like, okay, it works in Blender. It's basically the same in Unreal Engine so I can transition that stuff one-to-one. -one. And yet it has the worst out-of-the-box UV tools out of all the packages. <laughs> and, it, and UVs are the most important one of the most important aspects of a modeling package and yeah. they're horrendous they're actually awful yeah. um and like i know it it's like i i love blender i love the fact there's all these crazy add-ons that do really cool stuff and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm a big proponent of them however the fact that you need a paid add-on or a couple of paid add-ons to get like the uvs to be really good i'm like just just integrate that into the you really need to integrate that into like out the box blender because it's one of the biggest things as well anyone who doesn't like blender or they're like coming from maya maya has basically rism as this uv tool so like it's one mm -hmm. of the best it's like oh screw blender the uvs are horrible and i'm like yeah yeah they are it's like but this add-on makes it good and it's like oh i hate saying that uh, it's one of the biggest things i see like industry 3d artists push back against blender for it's like oh the uv tools are terrible and me saying, oh, yeah, but you get these add-ons, it isn't changing anyone's mind. Like, they're already kind of, no, yeah, it's, it's shit. It needs to have good UV tools for me to use it. And I'm like, ah, yeah, you're kind of right. <laughs> I can't disagree with you. Yeah, I mean, I agree. But also, like, I, I, I don't like to have to install a bunch of plugins. But at the same time, it's like, I use the Texel Density 
plugin and I use the mm-hmm. UV uh, UV toolkit or something. Yeah. I mean, it's isn't it like five bucks? Like I'd rather spend yes. five bucks on that than to pay for Maya. And um, yeah, I was gonna say, and you don't have to pay for Maya, which is super expensive. Yeah, uh, so I mean, I, I completely understand that. Um, as a concept artist, you don't have to deal with the UVs too much. Yeah. Um, so I think that's why it's so popular with with concept artists because it's really easy to do like box mapping um, and stuff like that. So, so I guess that was a bit of a side tangent on, soft- on software. Um, let's talk about more recent, like you know your more recent roles, like both more more so at Dice, I guess the transition to being an art director. Um, how like how. <clears throat> How does the challenges change? Like, because uh, as a concept artist, you're solving um, a vehicle, a weapon, a building, a shot, and you're solving that problem. As an art director, how much does that change? Like, because the way I'm envision- envisioning this before hearing an answer is that you're solving the problems on larger scales. You're not solving the gun, the car, you're solving the world. And all the stuff like that. What what's the transition into an art director role from a concept artist? Like, how much does the day to day change? Or how does your tasks change? And I know obviously that's going to be tied to the studio you're at. But like speaking high level, what was that like? Yeah, I, I would say it's it's very dependent on where you're at. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing is uh, when I was at Dice, there was quite a bit of an overlap between uh, concept art and art direction especially when i was at dice la so um i was already i've never really been in a position to like design this shoe design this doorway like do those kind of details um on on battlefield i have been focused a lot on the bigger picture of like what is this level about like what is the theme what is the visual uh trademark what what makes it different from the other levels like what is you know speaking about like just thinking about high level themes uh, visual themes and gameplay themes um so i was kind of already in that mind space and at isla i was very active with like putting together style guides and mood boards like here's a palette of images that i think this level should be mm-hmm. um and uh was doing pretty well with that like it uh, i think most of the levels for like the uh, which one was it the second or wait the third expansion pack for battlefield one which was this like naval themed one yes um i i put together a uh, uh referenced images for the four maps and it stayed pretty much consistent with with those early references uh, up until the end uh, naturally like there was an entire team doing that of course and the art director was uh, driving the look uh, for those really well um but i was i was kind of like already used to doing you know uh, contribute to the project in that sense so um i've just been continuing to do that i think you know people have recognized that i think about the, the big picture stuff Mm-hmm. And I, I I like to have those conversations. I like to talk to the narrative team and kind of ask them what what they are trying to um, you know what story they are trying to tell with this space. Uh, talk to our designers on like what kind of gameplay are they seeing in this space and kind of seeing how art can fit into that. Like how can we bring it together to be like one cohesive package? If that makes sense. So I. Normally, I don't think too much about roles. I don't think the transition was very extreme in terms of how I think about the project. Mm-hmm. Uh, it has been more on the you know, side of, as an art director, all of a sudden, everyone is looking at me for decisions. Yeah. And uh, you know, it's leading the team. It's standing in front of the team and kind of getting people motivated and uh you know staying optimistic about everything like there's more things like that than it is uh, and then it's been a mind shift in terms of how i think about the project like i was already kind of doing the same work i will say i probably have to like interact with all of the art disciplines 
to a greater detail as an art director than as a concept artist. Um, and that's where it helps to have had uh, to have a background in some VFX, uh, um, some a VFX background that I did in school. Um, so I kind of learned modeling and texturing and rendering, lighting, stuff like that when I was back in school. And, um, and that is, that helps me give like, uh, foundational knowledge that I can kind of communicate with the, the different disciplines. I guess it's a bit, it, it reminds me a little bit of what you said earlier with the, when you went to be a lead, it's like you went from, you're already doing a lot of stuff anyway, but when you're a lead is over in LA, it's like, I no longer have my lead there to you know, that level above me to kind of rely on if I need help. And I guess yeah. is that an extension is okay. I no longer have my art director to be that extra little you know, level. Now I'm the one who has to, like I said, face the team, lead the team, be in front of them, help, you know, put, you know, the, the, actually that's all for you. You said something about like the, um, I guess as an art director in that sort of role, the team's like kind of morale and all that sort of stuff as well kind of ties into it. Like you, you kind of need to keep the positivity up and like it's, I guess it's no longer about you and you just producing work. Like your job is more about now. Okay. I need to make sure I'm enabling the team and that they're happy and whether or not I'm producing the most amazing art directed piece of art out there is kind of come second to, I need to make sure the team is able to produce the art as well. Um, that side of things too, and this is, I guess this, this is more relevant to be when you become a lead. Was it hard? Like going from, okay, like my job is just to produce the highest quality art possible. That's, that's my job. I get paid to come up and do that. And you go into a lead role. It's like, okay, now my job is to make the team very functional. And you know, it kind of, you have to become more selfless, I guess. What was that like? What did did that even happen when you go into concept arts? I know that's what happened when you go into like kind of environment leads is you become more of a enabler, there's a producer of content. What was that like for concept art? It was very much still a producer of content. Cool. Um, it was uh, as a lead as a lead concept artist. Um, I think. I mean, yeah, it's 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 a little bit of both. Like you have to make art, you have to enable others. Um, and it's it's scary. I can't say like I, yeah, I was scared to move into lead, but I also felt very comfortable in the craft. So I wasn't really it wasn't that big of a di- uh, it wasn't that big of a difference. Um, moving into art direction has been scarier because like from one day to the next, all eyes on on you and you know everyone was like waiting to hear what you had to say about something and mm-hmm. uh that was scary at first and i i think you know early on i probably felt that like oh i have to have an opinion on everything um and that has pretty quickly transitioned into like well i need to i need to have leads like i need to have people that are experts in their craft um to be successful you know i need to lean on to others like I don't know too much about VFX. I don't know too much about environment art. So like I need people who are experts there that I can communicate with and that I can tell them that like, hey, this is important to me, um, and have them kind of run the internal, you know, mm. uh, discussions with their team. So yeah, like enabling others is is super important, obviously, and and uh, you know making sure that people feel like they are being heard and that they can drive things that are imp- are important to them um i think some art directors i've worked with a lot of art directors that are just like that seems to think that their job is about being nitpicky in details and like signing off on art exactly everywhere and um I I try to do that if it's important to me. Like some I have, you know, everyone has pet peeves and some things stand out to me and I'm like really bothered by it. Um other things I'm I I don't really care, so I I try to back off, you know. So like you kinda have to you have to evaluate when you're giving feedback to artists, you have to evaluate like how much can I push this artist because you you like you have to have an eye of uh eye for how people um react to your Mm -hmm. to your input and your feedback and if people are getting agitated or annoyed then you kind of have to like well you know let's 
choose your battles, right? Like, don't push too hard if it's someone who uh, gets super annoyed. Like, it's it's a constant balance, right? Because you're like you have to hit your goals as an art director, um, and you want to keep the the team happy or motivated. Um, and sometimes they are at odds with each other, and most okay. of the time, hopefully, they will, you know. That that Both point you said there, about the you know knowing how much can you push the artist. Now I just want to just dive into that a little bit more. Um, mm. So throughout your career, how like so I'm the kind of person I you know the, I like to be pushed. I like to try and get the, produce the best piece of content, and quite often I need the person behind me saying you can go further with that you can go further with that. Um, and the reason I, I sort of want to dive into it is I've, I've mentioned this multiple times to people before I was watching the documentary um, Last Dance with Michael Jordan. And one of his old coaches, Dougie Wheeler, says, like, you knew he, he, I mean, Michael Jordan knew he was going to be the greatest player of all time. But in his rookie year, everyone knew it. And he said, the way you show respect to a great player was you coach him and you coach him hard and you push him. Um, and I've I've thought about it. I'm like, does that trans- translate into art? Like, I guess it can. Um, I mean, anyone who's seen the film Whiplash, they know like you 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 kind of draw a draw a line there. How much are you the type of artist who likes to be pushed? You know, okay, I know I can be better, and I, I like to have that person behind me pushing me. Um, and how much does like do you think that's necessary as an art director to be like, I can, I know you don't, I know you think you're done. But you're not. There's an artist. That, there's a guy, Naughty Dog, who I was speaking to, and he said he was a great. He's a fantastic environment artist, and he kind of like he think he'd be done, and then um, Bruce Raley would be like, "Oh no, no, you're only halfway. Like now, now you think you're done. That's when you actually start working, and you need to push it like even further." And that's Naughty Dog. They are like the crowning gem of quality for video game art. But it's interesting. It's like he he felt every day he was being pushed out of his comfort zone, and he he said I I was grateful for it because I went way further than I ever thought I would or could. So how much do you think is like? Cause, and there's obviously a flip side to that because this sober this such a thing is going too far. You don't want to break people. You don't want to make people miserable. But how like how necessary do you think it is? Is it and like how much do you actually enjoy that conversation? Like hey, you can go further. Oh, I don't know if I can. And like you kind of pull people out of their comfort zones is that an enjoyable process is it a not enjoyable process like wh- what do you think about that idea uh so being working as an art director i think i mean i'm pushing for the things again that are important to me not everything is important to me or like i guess if i'm interacting with environment art for instance the quality of the details and pushing that extra detail is more in their wheelhouse than it is in mine Mm-hmm. Um, I will, you know, I, I, I don't like to give feedback, um, by just looking at something and giving my, like my gut reaction, because then all is going to come out is like my competence in this field. And what is my, what is in my head, basically, like, I'm going to gut react to what I see. What I want to do is like, I want an artist to present, here's what I'm doing. And here's my reference. Um, and then that makes that takes a lot of the like opinions out of it, and it makes it a lot easier because then I can be like, well, there's a lot of detail in this reference that is not in your in your uh, sculpt, and like I think you can push for this a bit more, and like how, what what do you think we can do to to achieve you know what you see down here, like this transition between two materials or whatever. Um, I, I, I like to do that. Like I, I like to have artists present their reference and like there's what showing what they're going for, so that uh, you know. So it's not about my super amazing artistic vision, and it, it becomes like it takes opinion out of the discussion and it becomes more tangible, and mm-hmm. I guess more I guess more technical. And a lot of the discussions at Dice was like this, like. We could have we could push ourselves very very far because we could always we were always comparing to reference we were always looking at you know how do we make this shot look more like this photo reference and then it's like well the sky is brighter and these assets are darker this rocks are not as shiny um, and everyone sees that and everyone agrees with it right 
Um, so that is that is one part of it. Um, I will. I I, I want to make sure that I'm getting what I need. Like I have like mm-hmm. most of the time, I have a specific problem that I need to solve, and that is kind of my my number one focus. Now, as a concept artist and like receiving that feedback, um, I have been in situations where it has been both extremely frustrating and others where it has been extremely motivating. Mm-hmm. Um, the motivating one, if I start with a good example, was an art director I worked with um, who seemed genuinely interested in making the best artwork that I that that he could get out of me, right? Yeah. So like he would sit next to me and look at my piece, and he was just like trying to dissect it in his head, and he was yeah, and he was very specific. But everything that he was saying um, improved the shot. It made the concept like objectively better. Like, yeah. and I could, I recognized that, and I was like, okay, that is a very, very good input. That was super motivating, and I really liked that. And he was also trying to empower me. I was super green at the time, so I was probably too early to to work with that guy because he's a really good art director. Um, but but he was trying to empower me. He was trying to let me, you know, explore my voice and kind of present to him what I think that this project should be. And I was just like, I understand now what he was getting at, but I was too green at the time to understand it. That's why I try to, I have to think before I give feedback. I, I also don't like to give feedback in like, I don't like to have reviews and see the work for the first time. I like mm-hmm. to you know get it over mail the day before or something so i have some time to kind of think about it dissect it sleep on it um and come to the meeting and be informed um that that usually helps me to kind of uh to give some reasoning yeah. behind uh the feedback that i'm giving and yeah. that is hopefully not hopefully that is not frustrating for the team Whoa. It, it just like honestly, so I get it. Like, yeah, you want to digest the art and like kind of wrap your head around what you're looking at and like what it is you do and don't like. Just about the good reaction stuff, though. Is there any? Is there value in that good reaction? Because you said like, yeah, sometimes if you, it, maybe it's in a field you're not like, you know, three D, for example. Isn't a good reaction kind of the reaction of the average person? Like, if you're like instantly just like, oh, something's wrong, or you know, instantly I'm like, I don't like this element. It's like, okay. Like, if that's my reaction, with my that's my gut reaction, not my artistic mind breaking down and thinking about this. It's the reaction of just instinct. Is there not value in that too? Because if I, I'm imagining, like, you know, is something my yeah you know, my um my old art teacher used to always say to me is like draw really mundane things that my mum would recognise because I could show her stuff and she could just knee jerk say yes or no. Like if I draw her mobile phone. Um, she could look at it and go, nope, that's 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 wrong. She wouldn't be able to tell me why. She wouldn't be able to break down what's good or bad about the image. Whereas when you speak to artists, like I said, we speak different languages and you can quite quickly, like I said, break stuff down and really be analytical about it. But is there not value in that good reaction, that, that instinctive, that feels wrong? Like before the, or do you go to that and then you work out in that like time leading up to it, why that, Good reaction took place, and that's what you're doing in that sort of lead up to it. There is, there is definitely value in that. I guess if I were to give an example, um, looking at character art and uh, like evaluating proportions of a character, your gut reaction might be like, "This looks, this looks wrong." Yeah, and which which is probably like then something is wrong, right? But if you're in a meeting and you need to give feedback and you say that like make the head smaller you know that might not be that might not be the right call like yeah. it might be the thing that looks off for you in that point in time but then the head you know for next week the head gets smaller and then it still looks weird so like you know proportions is all about like relationship between different parts like mm-hmm. the length of the arms and like you know i mean you you know the complexity of that stuff um so you don't want to end up in a 
space where like you're just giving feedback and then you're like oh no what i said last week was wrong let's change that back let's mm. do this instead uh like you don't you want to make informed decisions to make sure that you're moving forward in a way that uh you can stand by and that you can be confident in is the right choice um that becomes more important, I would say, as an art director. Like as a concept artist, when I was a lead concept artist, I would just like gut react to everything. This looks terrible, and I just like throw it out there, and <laughs> someone else have to solve it. Um, and uh, I was, I was, you know, always open about stuff like that, which is good. Like you should be open, and you should, you know, I, I firmly believe that a team should share their thoughts and opinions. Uh, but as an art director, you kind of you you're gonna be responsible for that, right? Yes. So you want to make sure that like uh, you don't want to frustrate artists by giving them this direction and then take that back and go this instead and then do something else. Mm. You want to make sure that like if you're giving feedback, um, you have confidence in that this is going in the right direction. Is there so ever I, a, is, is there ever a worry though with that where? By figuring out these problems, does, does it ever does it ever creep in? And this is yeah, you know, I I have no insight to this. This is purely ignorance. I'm, I'm speculating from. But does that ever lead into your solving the problems for somebody? Like if you look at the image for like a night, say you get a night before, you're looking at the image and you're like, hmm, this line isn't flowing. The background's a bit dark or whatever. Okay, I think you should do X, Y, and Z. Do you have to balance that out in a sense of I don't want to give you the answer, I want to give you a problem and what some of the causalities to their problems might be, um, and then you need to figure out a solution to that. Does, do, when you're trying to work out and do the the, the feedback side of that stuff, does it ever lead, it, lead into I might be giving you all the answers or I might be solving it for you rather than you solving it yourself? Does it ever enter that territory? Yeah. Well, absolutely. I think they are you're tapping into my growth opportunities. <laughs> like I think my I have a I have a tendency to want to give answers to everything. Yeah. Uh, but you're bringing up a really good point. I do think that is kind of where a really good um, art director can highlight the problem, but not not necessarily m uh, come up with a solution. Mm -hmm. So as especially when i do um when i work with external concept art houses um and i give feedback or even with the internal concept team sometimes like it's so it's so it's just natural for me to take a screenshot of what i'm seeing open it up in photoshop and doing a paint over and like yeah. fixing it and then i like I, I I feel that like I shouldn't be doing this. Like I I I, I don't want to be this specific. Mm -hmm. So I I instead I just do a snippet and then I kind of do red lines. I just draw with red lines like this area right here is not hitting uh, X Y and Z, and uh, like work on making it more believable or like work on this surfacing or whatever. Like instead of fixing it for them, I have to highlight it. Um, and maybe, you know, I, I, I do think that it kind of, uh, it kind of depends on the person, which is another, yeah. which is another, uh, challenge of, of art directing is I think you need to know your team and mm -hmm. you need to know who needs to hear exactly what to do and who needs to be given a problem to solve. I do think the more senior the people are that you're working with the more you have to outline the problem for them to solve. If someone is more junior, you probably will do them uh, them and yourself a favor by nudging them in the right direction. Yeah, it, it sounds, I mean, look, yeah, you're in an unenviable position because it's just like, yeah, it's that response, that, that tightrope of, I need to, yeah, we need to get to an end product here. We need to have the thing, but it's wrong. And I know it's wrong, but I want to also, in, power this person and help them grow mm. and it's but we need to yeah you know, we have deadlines we have stuff to make it's we're making <laughs> a game here it's like it i don't ever you it's a hard position like it it's one of the things where which there's a deck i struggle with like you know oh, this, this asset's wrong no you're doing it wrong okay we had two rounds of feedback and it's still not right and it's like you want to just grab the asset and do it yourself and you're like no because that's 
not solving anything here. Okay, we'll go through this. Let's break this down. Is how much I, I, I ask this a lot because this is one of the I've been told this is my biggest strength and weakness. Um, when you're working with artists, how much is it good or okay? Let me think about ways to phrase this question during your career when you've had like art directors give you feedback, have you ever had to push back to the art director and be like? Okay, I see you. I see what you're trying to do. And not in a way where you're like, oh, I don't like the fact you're telling me I'm wrong. More, okay, I see what your your feedback is and what you're trying to achieve. I'm not sure that's the best way to do it. What about this? It, you know, for, for a concept artist, is that encouraged? Is that discouraged? Because it's been talking to an art director. They have bigger visions than just this one piece you're working on. Um, that type of interaction, is, is it a good or a bad thing, do you think? I think it's good um, when it works. Um, if I think about my experience, I haven't. I've definitely been pushing back a few times. Um, my general, so I, I, I guess my my general mindset is, um, um, yeah, you like you you should. You should present what you think is right, but at the same time, I don't think an art director should have to fight his team yes. to get to get them to do what he's after or she. Um, so I've been. Uh, I would usually I would use like the op- like it. It completely depends on the situation, right? Obviously. Yeah, yeah. But let's say that I have an opportunity to like present something that I think like I get information and I'm I'm trying to solve it then I will try to to the best of my ability present what I think it should be and explain why like mm-hmm. I don't think that this is going to work I think this is a better solution for uh, these reasons and present it back and if the art director goes no I don't think that's the way to do it and it's like yeah okay I'm, fine you're I'm, right. I'm probably I'm probably pretty quick to back off then. Then I'm yeah. go like, okay, fine. And then like, if we continue, uh, like then other, the, the opportunity can come up again, obviously. So like we continue going in that direction. I can either bring it up again, that like, Hey, I think this is not really going to work. This is going to look dull or whatever. Um, but yeah, so I will, I will, you know, continue to push for it when I have the opportunity, but I don't want to, sound like a broken record and i don't yeah. want to be hard to work with like i don't want to be someone who's just kicking and screaming uh, because mm. i want want it to be my way like that's that's why we have art directors like they yes. are there to make decisions and to streamline the process um and to make things move forward and it's really hard to do that if if you have too many people on the team that wants to do their own thing um so there's a balance there but in the best scenarios, I think an art director can empower their artist to present to them what they think it should be, and then they can kind of feedback on that and uh, you know move move things forward that way. I guess that's one of the biggest hallmarks, I guess, for like if when you're progressing through your career and going from, let's like, say, junior to mid to senior, it's being able to have conversations in a tactful way. And like, I mean, if you ever come across as complaining or whining, then you're probably not doing it in the best way possible. But like, mm-hmm. if you're able to have have conversations, I guess, like it's a, it, I mean, it's hard for some people. Some people are, you know, very um, introverted and they don't want to put their necks out there and go, hey, I feel like this may be the wrong way. But I do feel like a lot of this, at least in my experience, most of the senior people across all disciplines, like they, are very quick, not quick to speak. They're very happy to speak when they feel like they need to, but it's not like they're, you know, it doesn't make it mean they all are super vocal, but they're, they will, if they feel like something's wrong, they will voice their opinion. And like you said, you don't want to want, if an art director says, okay, I hear you, but I'm still going to go this way. It's like, okay, like I've been heard. We've had the conversation. We're done. You know, then, then go, okay, I know yeah. you're hearing me, but I still think you're wrong. It's like, well, okay, he's the art director. Oh, she's the art director. Like, you know, Respect yeah. the rank, I guess. Exactly. I think that is that is um, something I've seen with very senior people. Is like they still have that respect for 
positions on the team. So like they will be doing exactly what you said and like speak their opinion. If we decide to go somewhere else, they just like you know yeah. shrug of the shoulders and they move on with it. Uh, I know one of my friends has been talking about the mid-level disease, which is like something a phrase that she uses for people who have been through enough games to kind of have some experience right. and really strong opinions about how things should be made and keep and get like really really frustrated because you know we're not doing it the way that they want it to be so like somewhere in between like mid-level and senior you you sometimes see this um um uh, tendency in some people to be like super opinionated and really frustrated where you know they want it to be this specific way and then when people are not listening to them or we decide to go some other way they just like build up frustration and get super angry about it rather than just like sucking it up and like seeing the opportunities where we're with where we're going um so i think that's that's definitely something that comes with seniority so I've never heard that phrase before. I'm just thinking about it. It's probably times of my career. I'll probably <laughs> there's probably a few people who listen to this who know me are probably laughing right now. But I can't help but feel like that only comes up if you're not looking at the people around you. So for uh, good example, Kurt, great example. Like we both know Kurt. I worked with him at Counterplay. I thought I knew shaders. And I thought I knew art. And you speak to Kurt, and you're like. Ah, okay, I don't know shit. Um, it's hard to get on your high horse to say we should do it X, Y, and Z way when you're when you around talent. Um, you know, there's a guy, a counter player, a, a tech director there, smartest guy I've ever seen using Real Engine. And I'm like, okay, like this is, I know very little compared to this person. I can't, it, it isn't, you, you, you know, you get humbled, I guess. I, I can't imagine... If you that that's sort of that mid-level disease, this is a the, the phrase. You can't the people who suffer from that. You can't be looking outside too much. I mean, if you're working in the games industry, nearly every studio you have extreme talent, especially in the senior senior roles and the director roles. I find it if you can't the people who suffer from that can't be looking at the team around them and really objectively looking at them and going, "Oh, these people are where they are because of X Y right. reasons," right? Like, no director, and it, like, nepotism aside, I don't think you can get to a director role in any studio, in any company, whether that's tech, art, yeah, financial directors, whatever. You can't get there without being really fucking competent in your role. So it's like, for uh, anyone uh, mid-level to go, you know, with an art director or a senior or whoever, and kind of go, oh, well, you know, we should do it my way because on this past project we did it this way. It's like, yeah, okay, you may have a point, but this dude's not there for no reason. Like this dude's there because he's been there and done it, and he knows what he's doing. It's um, you if if someone's suffering from that or someone's in in that mindset, they they can't be looking past, you know around them too much because you know one glance oh. at the team around you, you'll wake up very quickly that these people are amazing. I agree. Like ego is definitely a big part of that, and I think that's where that's what happens, right? Like people's ego get the best of them. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas if you're more senior, if you've been through a couple of different projects, you've probably seen different um, ways of doing things, mm-hmm. and then you're being more, um, yeah, like you said, humble and open to. <laughs> there are different ways of solving this problem, right? Um, and uh, and also understanding, like, if you're creating a new team or if you're if you're joining a new team. Um, being open to, I mean, you can definitely say that, you know, you should share your perspective. This is how we did it at our past studio or like, you know, if you have experience of of the area. Um, But also understand that there's always reasons for people doing it differently, right? So Mm. um, I have experience of building battlefield levels. That doesn't apply to everything, right? Like that is its own little ecosystem. And we had things that worked really well for that um that might not work for other types of games so you kind of have to think about it that way you know what i think that's that's actually a pretty good place to finish up on because i think that's a good bit of advice for a lot of people myself included i probably could do hearing that sometimes um 
Eric, dude, I, like I said, it's a weekend we've recorded this. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your weekend. Um, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Like, I know we've spoken a little bit in um, side chats at work, and, like, that's what, you know, you, you have a lot of experience. It's been really cool to talk to a concept artist at length as well, because I think I've only had one on in the past, and we didn't even scratch the surface. And it's, it's actually encouraging. <laughs> I, I was worried, like, oh, it's going to be really hard to have a conversation with somebody who I have no background in concept art whatsoever so it's not like i can speak at the same level compared to say like environment art but this has been really fun like i've really enjoyed this conversation and i think a lot of people will enjoy this one there's a lot of um useful information not just concept artists, just career in general people in general interactions in general so thank you thank you so much for coming on oh thank you um everyone who's listening same as every week like you know like follow share subscribe the more that the podcast gets shared around, the more people that can um, listen to the great knowledge that Eric has to share and all the other guests. So until next week, Eric, it's been a pleasure, dude, and I'll catch everyone next week.